Welcome everyone to the webinar today. Uh, we're going to wait just a minute and let all of our attendees get on here. Get, we'll get situated. All right. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we are very excited to bring you uh, NICU Parenting, The Emotional Journey with Mara Tesler Stein today. Uh, my name is Eva Fassbinder Brummel, and I will be moderating the session. So uh, this webinar is, uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. This net webinar yeah. is you by the Wisconsin Association for, thank you, for perinatal care, um, otherwise known as WAPC. And so for those of you who are unfamiliar with WAPC, we are an individual membership organization with the mission to improve perinatal care. Our members are located throughout the state of Wisconsin and nationally. The statewide office is based in Madison. Uh, through its multidisciplinary membership and its partnerships with healthcare providers, parents, governmental agencies, professional societies and, and healthcare systems, WAPC stays current about key issues in perinatal care and how they affect women, infants, and families. And being multidisciplinary, we feel that WAPC is really unique and it's one of um, WAPC's greatest strengths because it positions WAPC to gain a wide variety of perspectives about what those key issues are and how we can work together to improve perinatal care. So WAPC members stand united in that common goal of providing excellent health care to women, infants, and families in an ever-changing, and especially now during COVID, an ever-changing health care environment. Um, the association offers resources and opportunities to help members meet this goal and the daily challenges uh, that you um, face in the workplace. So we, I also just want to thank you for choosing this webinar today. We know that you have many other online learning opportunities to choose from right now and we really appreciate your time and you uh, choosing to participate today. And we are able to offer this at no cost through the support of the Department of Health Services uh, at, from the state of Wisconsin and the Perinatal Foundation. Uh, and, but we're also very much supported by our membership. So if you would consider joining, if you agree and want to be part of a multidisciplinary team that wants to improve perinatal care, um, we would absolutely welcome you with open arms and would love to have you join. So please go to perinatalweb.org and check it out. Um, and we also want to appreciate the work of our planning group for this educational series. Members of this group have no relevant conflicts of interest to disclose. Okay, moving on. Um, there are other disclosures there just for your reference. Just please note that you do need to attend the full session and complete the evaluation in order to receive continuing education credit. We offer continuing education credit for nurses and for physicians. Um, so that's something that you can watch your inbox for um, this week for the evaluation link and also some other resources that we will um, include in there, including the recording. So. Um, and so we want to uh, talk about uh, what we're going to learn today. So at the end of this presentation, participants will be able to review three losses faced by clients as they journey through the NICU, identify and recognize the emotional experience associated with these losses, and name specific approaches that could be helpful to clients as they seek to cope and find emotional resolution to their losses. And our learning outcome, participants will incorporate the approaches learned today into practice, recognizing the work within a relate their work within a relationship based framework. We intend for participants to see families as whole rather than as individual patients in order to guide them more effectively and to recognize families as an essential part of the healthcare team. 
And before we begin, just to let you know kind of how we're going to, you know, handle questions. Um, you are, of course, in listen only mode. You're all muted by default and you will remain that way unless you ask me to take you off of mute. So if you would like that, please make sure to raise your hand and I'm going to take that as a signal that you would like to be unmuted to speak directly. Um, if you, you can do that at any point during the presentation, our speaker is, is fine with that. Um, so just you can raise your hand and we'll find a good time for for your question. So just note that hand icon and use that if you'd like. We do encourage you to ask your questions by speaking directly if you'd like, um, but you can also ask them, of course, by typing them into the Q&A. Uh, we would prefer if you try to, to type your questions in the Q&A field rather than the chat box because it just helps us to organize them. Um, and so I will communicate those to the instructor as as we we get them in um, and we may wait. Some of them may wait until the end. We're also going to have some time at the end for questions as well. Um, if we don't get to your question due to time constraints um, or if you think of a question later, please feel free to use that email address and email the question to us and we'll make sure to put you in touch with Dr. Stein. All right. And so right now, we would like to learn a little bit more about you um, to tell us what you do. So we're going to have you answer a poll right now. And um, you should be able, I'm going to launch this poll. So you should be able to see that now and go ahead and vote. Um, if you don't see yourself on this list, just type in what you do on the chat and that'll give us a good idea as well. So while you are voting there, I am going to introduce our speaker. So we are very honored and very grateful to welcome our speaker today. Mara Tesler Stein is a clinical psychologist. She is the founder and director of the Touchstone Institute for Psychotherapy and Training in Lincolnwood, Illinois. Uh, Dr. Stein earned her undergraduate degree from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and her doctoral degree in clinical psychology from the Chicago School for Professional Psychology. She is an author, a trauma therapist, and an international presenter on the topics of perinatal and postpartum trauma, having authored two books for parents of premature babies and has worked for 25 years in the field of perinatal and postpartum trauma. She is also a certified EMDR therapist and EMDRIA approved consultant and trainer. She has been an invited lecturer around the world on these topics and we are so grateful that she is sharing her time and expertise with us today. Thank you so much Dr. Stein and with that I can turn things over to you and we can take a look also at our poll. Oh yes, results. I would love to I'm see the to, results of the poll. Yeah, I'm going to end the polling everyone so and I'll yeah. share those results. I hope you can see them. Fabulous. I'm sharing them now. Looks Great. like, yeah. Nice diversity here. Thank you guys Good. for for responding to this. It's helpful for me to know who all is here. I tried to fill out the poll and it wouldn't let me. Um, and okay. I would have checked off NICU parent and therapist. And I find the NICU parent piece of this to be so foundational for me. You know, nobody imagines that they're going to be the one standing over their newborn baby's uh, warming bed, that they're going to be the one afraid to touch their baby, not sure what the impact is going to be, how to understand those monitors, not, not even to be able to understand the cues that this brand new, tinier than expected baby is giving out. This you know, I don't know about you, these were the kinds of things I thought happened to other people. Um, you know, when you do all the right things, you follow all the rules, you think it's supposed to be okay. You know, we're supposed to be able to trust the medical system. You're supposed to be able to trust your body. It's natural, right? All supposed to happen just like you plan. The, the premature birth of a baby, the traumatic birth of a baby, the, the birth of a, of a sick or fragile baby, um, is, is traumatizing, it's unsettling, it's overwhelming. It can be incredibly immobilizing. Here we have this unfinished person, uh, not what you were planning. You were planning for, for uh, a, a new person, unformed, but not like this. 
not with this raw nervous system. This person needs intensive care, highly specialized intervention in a way that we're not expecting. The, the typical journey of parenthood is hijacked. It didn't take very long into my experience of the NICU with my newborn twins after a six and a half week in hospital bed rest and preterm labor, I went in at 24 weeks and they were born at 30 weeks. When I realized that when you walk into the NICU, you absolutely have to be willing to let go of everything you thought you knew about babies and about how to be a parent in order to, to absorb what you need to know about the NICU. And it's hard enough to adjust to new parenthood, especially if it's your first child, but not only if it's your first child, because after all, every child is its own universe. Uh, they bring their own particular uh, personality, temperament, needs and challenges. That's how it's supposed to be. They're individuals. We just don't know them yet. You know, even when you have that, I always call it the unicorn scenario. Oh, everything is perfect and rainbows, you know, the perfect, you know, no trouble conceiving, beautiful pregnancy, ideal, you know, idyllic birth. Parents and in-laws are fabulous, partners, all that beautiful stuff that never happens. At least not for every baby you have. Um, it's still challenging to make that adjustment, to find your rhythm, to find your identity as a parent, right? But here, when you're thrust into, the, into this parenthood in this way that, that, that sort of feels like you missed a step, you know, like, wait a minute, this is not what I expected. Even if, if a parent has, has spent time on bed rest, you still haven't gotten into that rhythm. It, it's very, very hard to figure out, how am I supposed to do this? When families especially have had um, difficult news over the course of the pregnancy and there's been some uncertainty about whether or not the baby is gonna survive, for example, people are often surprised that there's still layers of loss involved in the NICU state because after all, your baby's alive. Shouldn't you just be grateful? Shouldn't you just be happy? But you know, when, when a pregnancy has gone awry, when the birth has gone awry, when these first days are not what are expected, there is so much loss. You don't get to finish your pregnancy when you have a premature baby. I was thinking the other day, I've never been more than 36 weeks pregnant. I had a, a child after my twins, born at 36 weeks. I'd gone into preterm labor with him at 30, 31 weeks. Never finished a pregnancy. You don't get those moments with, the, with your baby like, here, here I am, I am me. You don't get those moments of you know, skin to skin in the delivery room. That joyful delivery, the newborn cry. Taking your time, not being rushed when the babies are born, baby or babies are born. Nursing. Now it can be challenging again, even in the unicorn scenario. But you try to you try to breastfeed a, a baby in the NICU. Not so not so simple for a whole bunch of reasons. And and the simplicity of bringing an older child, family members, to just meet the baby. You know, for <laughs> NICU parents often feel like you know they have the this theoretical child. You know, like no really, here's pictures. No really, really, this is my baby. I promise. You, you don't get those, those, uh, those experiences. In addition to that, there's, there's a, the loss of the baby that you imagined, because this baby will not be the baby that you imagined. That baby entered the, light, the world differently than the baby you imagined. Very often, there's a, a feeling of loss of trust in the medical system. Wait a minute, I followed all the rules, I did everything you said, this was not supposed to happen. How could this be? And of course, sometimes in the NICU, a baby dies. And so there can be as well the loss of a baby or the loss of one or more in a set of multiples. So much uncertainty, so much loss of expectable rhythms within a normative framework. So instead, 
parents enter this foreign land where there's a whole lot of equipment, a whole lot of support to keep this baby alive and for everybody who's caring for the baby to, to be monitoring what's going on. The baby does not look like the baby you imagined. The skin looks different. The muscle tone looks different. Eyes may not open. There may not be eyelashes. I can remember coming up to one of my girls and touching her ear and bending it in and it just stayed there because the cartilage hadn't been fully formed yet. Some babies are born, they don't have fingernails yet. Baby does not look the same. You can see how it would be so frightening for a parent. Parent doesn't want to, to do harm, doesn't want to make anything worse. Baby's attached to all kinds of stuff. Parents can't tell the difference between what's, mon what's doing monitoring and what's doing life support or other kinds of support. You know, I always tell people, you know, most of the stuff attached to your baby is actually monitoring things, depending, of course, on the baby. It's a lot of monitoring. And, and then, of course, some things that are delivering care as well. Imagine then what it's like to hold your baby along with your baby's life support equipment. This mother is very fortunate that she's in a NICU where they're set up for that clearly. And the nursing staff must be very comfortable saying, well, of course you can do kangaroo care, which is the skin to skin care that's so helpful to parents and to, and to babies. It's, it's incredibly, incredibly lonely, this experience. It's disorienting, it's overwhelming. And the first thing that, that we lose in a perinatal crisis is, is your innocence. And the second thing is your peer group. So it's who are you gonna talk to? People wanna make it okay. People wanna say, well, I knew somebody who had a baby or who was early and they're thinking about a baby born, you know, at 37 weeks, maybe 36 weeks. Maybe they heard a story about a, a baby who was born at 20, 28, 29, 30 weeks, but they haven't necessarily had the experience themselves. So finding a safe space genuinely with people who understand to talk about the experience is priceless because it's unlikely that your friends, your, your sister, your mother, your mother-in-law, your neighbor will actually speak this language. And speaking the language makes an enormous, enormous difference. There's so much to learn, there's so much to adjust to. And so when I work with families and when I work with professionals, I organize it like this. When, when um, Debbie Davis and I, who's my co-author, uh, started working on our first book, which is for parents of premature babies. Our second book was for all, ba all families who had babies in newborn intensive care, not necessarily just prematurity. What we, what we realized as we were doing these interviews around, from, with parents around the world is that there's really three core experiences, tasks, processes that families are um, needing to engage and mobilize during this experience. The first is managing feeling, all kinds of feelings. Some of it has to do with emotional regulation. Some of it has to do with how this actually feels, what this experience is like. Uh, some of it is, is the, the trauma and the grief, all kinds of, all kinds of emotional uh, internal experience. The second is managing relationships, relationships with the baby, Relationships with family, relationships with your partner, relationships with healthcare providers, work, the outside world, a lot of relationships that are going to be different when you have a baby in the NICU. And then finally, developing your sense of yourself as a parent to this baby. All right? So even if you have older children, even if you have prior parenting experience, parenting a baby who needs newborn intensive care is necessarily different. How different is gonna depend, but it's different. And what does it mean to you? How do you understand yourself as a parent to this baby is, is a process and it's an, an, an experience, a task. So managing feelings. There are different ways to grieve. 
And as we, we've established, there are so many losses and often ongoing losses in a NICU experience. We anticipate something's gonna happen, something good, baby's gonna get off the ventilator, baby's gonna get off oxygen. And then if that doesn't happen or it doesn't happen in the expected time, there's loss, there's fear. What does this mean? What does this mean about the baby? What does it mean about me? And, and people do grieve differently. There's the, the typical style of grieving, when we think about grief, is called uh, intuitive grieving. And it's a, it's a style of grieving that in, that's much more emotive, much more connected to the emotion, expressive of the emotion. So crying, thinking about the baby, talking about the baby, uh, expressing what's happening, seeking connection, or, or even just thinking about it alone, but being very immersed in the feeling is, is typically what we call intuitive grieving. But there's also a style of grieving called instrumental grieving. And instrumental grieving is about what you do. And, you know, nothing is ever going to be split by gender 100% or even close to that, we typically will see moms will tend to be intuitive grievers, dads will tend to be instrumental grievers because that's how people tend to be socialized. But of course, I, I and I'm sure all of you have seen the reverse. Instrumental grieving, one of the best examples that I can think of of instrumental grieving is the dad who disappeared um, night after night into the garage doing his woodworking and what he was doing was building a coffin for his baby who was dying. He didn't cry a lot, he didn't talk a lot, but he was grieving and he was doing. For some people, uh, the grieving is in their, their focus on taking care in this country of insurance, insurance claims, insurance payments, making sure they go to work while the baby's in the NICU so that they can be home when hopefully the baby comes home. But being focused on that as a task, Focus on that, that's, some, that's important. Families deal with trauma. Perinatal experiences are very often traumatizing, if not always traumatizing. That doesn't mean everybody develops uh, post-traumatic stress disorder in its full-blown form. But trauma is an injury. Trauma is a wound, a disruption, a rupture in what we're prepared for and what we're expecting. So much so that the nervous system can't really handle it or can't fully handle it. When that happens, those experiences get snarled up instead of getting woven into experience. We're always weaving experience together. That's what we do as human beings. Some of these experiences and, and ways of being in the world we're born with, some we're given, some we choose. If I had my choice, I'd be choosing, you know, Silk and cotton thread, soft, smooth, you know, beautiful colors. When I went into preterm labor with my twins, it felt like somebody had thrown me some barbed wire and I'm supposed to weave with that. It doesn't weave very well. Um, and what happens with something like barbed wire is it snags on all kinds of stuff and not always the stuff that you expect, actually. All kinds of other stuff starts to come up that, that you were not prepared for. And that's, that's characteristic of trauma. Certainly there's fear. And I think that it's really easy um, for people who are working in this area day in and day out to kind of know, yes, there's fear, but not to really deeply um, know that. I developed a course, it's about 18 years ago now, hard to believe, for my graduate school um, on perinatal trauma. Um, and I brought my class to the NICU where my girls had been born. So this was already four or five years later. And the neonatologist who met with us was wonderful. And he was always the guy who um, took care of the sickest babies. And so he was very, he was psychologically minded. And I think that was why he volunteered. And at one point he said, you have to remember that this is probably the scariest thing that's ever happened to people. And I was sitting next to him and I just echoed him. And I said, yeah, it's terrifying. And he stopped cold and he looked at me and he said, terrifying? And I said, yeah, terrifying, absolutely terrifying. You don't speak the language. You don't know what anything means. You're completely overwhelmed. As moms, 
moms will often say they already feel like their bodies betrayed their baby, let their baby down. They've already screwed this up. So the fear of, of, of doing harm is tremendous. But it struck me that he knew, but he didn't know at the same time. So really getting in touch with that can be very helpful. And then, of course, finding meaning in this experience is key. So with all of those chaotic emotions, remember, even intuitive grievers may fall prey, and it's not all bad, to the urge to do. So pumping, for example, uh, even if pumping is not going well, trying to get things to happen is a way to try to organize. It's just a way for you to understand what's going on there. It's not really just about control. I hear people say, well, they're trying to find something they can control. That's part of it. But part of it is that with trauma, we do better when we can mobilize. It's not about power and control per se. It's about action. When we're frozen, when we're immobilized, when we're cornered, we, the trauma can't move. We're really frozen and stuck. So having something to do helps the weaving to happen, helps the movement to happen, helps you to get used to the threads that you've been thrown, including the barbed wire. And so as clinicians, what we need to do is to listen. So we know this, right? But how do you listen? What does that mean, really, to listen? So we hear the words, we hear the language. But how do you hear what's underneath? How do you hear what's woven inside? So this, this image, which now you can find apparently everywhere online, was actually given to me by a neonatologist in Australia named Guan Ko, who presented at a conference that a group of parents of premature babies, we put this together, it was about 20 years ago. And he, this is, I've used this ever since because I think that it really captures it. You, you look, you really look, don't be distracted. Look, look and see what's coming through, not just in the words. Pay full attention and let yourself feel some of what the parent across from you is telling you so that you, you can really feel it more deeply. And feel all of them. Because parents, especially at the beginning, or especially when there's something additional going on, another crisis within the NICU uh, experience, they may look really fragmented. They may look really all over the place. But it's really important to remember, for many, many of these people, their life was really just fine until this crisis hit. I mean, we all have stuff, right? And of course, some of you are working in settings with people whose lives were already chaotic. And so it's even more important, actually, to find some cohesion behind the, the disarray, behind the static that you're hearing. But remember, for a lot of people, we, we were okay before. I was hospitalized at 24 weeks on a morning where I went in for a routine ultrasound and then a quick, doc, quick doctor's visit to be told that I was a, I was a centimeter dilated and 50% effaced. Doctor said, I'm gonna send you up to the labor and delivery unit, put you on a monitor. You need to make any phone calls. And I said, Do I, should I expect to be here all day? <laughs> she just looked at me like, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. I think she couldn't bear to tell me like a lot of days maybe. Hopefully, hopefully a lot of days. So four weeks later, as I'm laying in a hospital bed, wondering, wait a minute, I was teaching a bunch of courses, which somebody took over for me. You know, I haven't heard from my students. Now, this was 1996 in the pre-email days and pre-cell phone days. So I started to think, what happened to my students? So one day, nurse walks in, and without saying a word, hands me a card. Open up the card. Lo and behold, it's a card signed by all my students. Well, that's within a month. Flip over the envelope, look at the postmark, and it's dated about four weeks ago. I looked at her, looked at, looked at, at the date. She knew exactly what, was, what I was wondering, and she said to me, nobody could figure out who Dr. Stein was. It had been addressed to Dr. Stein, not to terrified women in a hospital bed on the antepartum unit. Four weeks. Nobody could figure out who Dr. Stein was. I was both. I was Dr. Stein and I was terrified mother 
prospective mother, mother in this hospital bed, asking 100,000 questions every time my contraction started to increase. It's both. We have to see both. Until we see both, it's hard for parents to see both and to find themselves as parents. How do you identify yourself as a parent in the midst of this crisis? How do you understand your role with this baby, especially when your baby is in, ten, in intensive care, right? You touch, touch a premature baby and they desat. The saturation, oxygen the saturation goes down, all the alarms go off. You're like, I will take three steps back and let the people who are experts take care of my baby because I do not want to do harm. How do I make sense of this? How do I see myself as a parent? And it's about mobilizing. Right, right around four, four weeks is like apparently a very significant time in my timeline. About four weeks after my girls were born, sitting, sitting there, spent all day there because I wasn't working at the time, didn't have older children. And one of the babies, Gabriella, her oxygen saturation started to dip. Now, my kids didn't have that kind of stuff happen. Very commonly in the NICU, you see um, preemies especially, um, because the brainstem is, is immature, they sort of forget to breathe or they breathe really shallowly and their oxygen sacs drop. Sometimes their heart rates drop. That was just not one of the things that happened. My girls were on oxygen. They actually came home on oxygen. It was very strange. So her oxygen kept dipping, kept dipping, kept dipping. And I had this bad feeling in my stomach. I asked the nurse. She said, well, it's a preemie thing. So that didn't mean anything to me. I didn't understand what that meant. What do you mean that's a preemie thing? What she meant was, they breathe very shallowly, and sometimes they hold their breath and the oxygen drops. It's because the brain stems immature. That's a preemie thing. Kept asking, kept asking, kept getting no, no answer. Kept saying, what's going on? This is not usual. Went to the charge nurse and said, could you please um, page our attending, the doctor who followed them through the course of the NICU, no matter who was um, on service that day. Then it was change of shift and they kicked us off the unit which is a whole different conversation. Not all units do that anymore, thankfully. I'm pacing, pacing, pacing in the parent room. In the doorway comes the attending, who I did not know. I mean, I knew him by sight. And he says, I want you to know we care about your little one. We want to wanna take care of her. We just don't want to intervene too quickly. And I, I said to him, I don't want you to intervene. I want you to, to diagnose. And I, I must have dropped my gaze. And I burst into tears. And I looked up. And he was gone scared the hell out of the doctor, whoosh, tears, fine, pace, 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 a few minutes later, in the doorway appears his resident, must have really scared the doctor, he says, we're going to do an x-ray, fabulous, come back on the unit, about an hour later, sends the resident over, looks at me, and he says, she has some pulmonary edema, she has some fluid in her lungs, we're going to give her some Lasix, she's a diuretic, and we're gonna monitor her. She has some pulmonary edema. And I looked at him, my whole body shifted, and I just looked at him and said, I know. I told you something was different here. I told you, I knew. That's the first time I really knew I was this little lady's mother in that mama bear sense of, I know you, I get you, and I will speak on your behalf. I was like, oh, amazing. Lots of times parents will tell you the first time they felt that budding sense of self as a parent was the first time they held their baby, especially skin to skin. It's so powerful. So, so, so powerful. Be aware that around identity and relationships and attachment you may see parents hold back from touching, from attending. It took me all morning to go finally to the charge nurse and say, please, please page our attending. Something's not right. My nurse said it's okay. She said it's a premium thing. I don't know. Holding back. Why? Not because we're not attached. Because we are attached. Because the hesitation is about protectiveness. The hesitation says, I don't want to make anything worse. 
So be mindful of the conclusions that you draw when you're working with families about what certain behaviors mean. We aren't scared about things that don't matter. We don't feel loss about things that aren't important. These relationships that we're developing, primarily with the baby, because that's, that's the new factor, this new baby, what does that mean? How do I learn your cues? How do I learn how to touch you? How do I recognize what you're telling me? Is a process, and of course with any baby, it's changing. And with a preemie baby, a sick baby, a baby who's been traumatized by delivery, also can be evolving. How do you begin to, to talk to other people who are important to you about, about yourself, about your baby, about what's important to you, about what you need? So identity and relationships and feelings, as you can imagine, are all going to interweave. We, we need to also remember how important it is, no matter whether a baby lives or dies, the parent is still the parent to this baby forever. And, and there is a relationship with this baby forever. How to understand that how to connect with that in a way that feels authentic and true to the family is also a process. Remember that with family members and with extended friend networks and coworkers, people don't feel like the same people they were before. They may not feel like they fit in the way that they did before. Very often we need to ask people around us as, as parents, to do things that they don't want to do. What do you mean I have to wash my hands? Ah, right? We know how that feels now, right? Here we are in COVID and we're, think about all of this stuff now that, that echoes this experience, that echoes bed rest, that echoes a NICU stay. I need to scrub before I, I can get near this person that I love because I need to protect them. And I don't know what I'm carrying in with me. I feel fine but it doesn't matter because their safety is more important. I need to learn how to engage in a way that's different. Think about all of the times that we hear about people on a, on a unit with COVID and how family members cannot come. There, there, at least when my babies were in the NICU, this has changed for many families, but there's, a, there's certainly a limit to how many people can come on the unit. And, and we could only have parents or grandparents on the unit. We couldn't bring a friend. We didn't have any family in town. So who can come visit? Who can come be there? I would like to also say parents aren't visitors. Uh, they get called visitors. Parents aren't visitors. Parents are coming to parent their baby, to take care of their baby. And this is one of the, the, the central pieces of, of, of a philosophy of care we call relationship-based care. Relationships are the cornerstone of solid health care. Because really, we are taking care of, of a baby, but there is no such thing as just a baby. Donald Winnicott was a psychoanalyst in, um, in the early 20th century. Um, and he says there was no such thing as a baby. What does that mean? Baby can't survive without a caregiver, typically a parent. Baby is a, ba a baby and, a baby and who's taking care of you. And so similarly, I think there's really also no such thing as a parent without also remembering there's a baby, whether the baby lives or dies. We are dyads, we're triads in combination. Relationship-based care supports the relationships, parental identity development, and emotional regulation, all of which are resources, internal resources for families. And our work doesn't matter if you're a nurse, a physician, midwife, uh, a unit perinatal social worker, a psychotherapist working outpatient, any care provider, anybody supporting a family, our work is to support and foster the bond between parents and babies. Always support the bond. We are, wa we are watching over the parents developing sense of themselves as parents to this baby. The baby is part of a family and the family is part of a healthcare team. The family has a job, the parents have a job, they don't want your job. 
They don't want the nurse's job. They don't want the doctor's job. That day when I said, please page the attending, I did not want the nurse's job. I was doing my job. I did my job as mom. My job is vigilance. My job is attachment. My job is love. That's the job of the parent. And thank goodness. Because the parent is the continuous variable. Even when you have on a unit something like prim primary nursing, where you have the same nurses over and over again who get to know you, get to know the baby, fantastic. The parent is still the continuous variable. The nurse who said to me it's a preemie thing was one of my favorite nurses and was a primary nurse who took care of Gavi almost every day. But I had a feeling. We hold each other. We are nested one inside the other. We support the parents, providing relationship-based, developmentally supportive care. We are supporting parental development so that parents can, in turn, provide relationship-based, developmentally supportive care to their babies. We also need to be attentive to who's supporting the care providers. So here is some work that, that I like to do as well. Debbie Davis and I, after our first book came out in 2003, the second one for NICU, NICU families came out in 2013, and we had, we had said for many years, our next book needs to be for healthcare providers. And right before COVID, we sat down and said, I think it's time. So that's, that's our next project. What do you all need? So as we look at how parents are doing, as we look at their struggle, remember that we are looking at their struggle and at their disarray and understanding their disarray as a consequence of how important this is. That they're struggling because this matters. Parents need to know that we don't think they're incompetent just because they're terrified that we don't think they're undeserving because they're angry and maybe hostile or sharp, or that we think we're, that they're helpless and incapable when they're in a moment of shock. One of these ideas that often persists is that parents are too emotional or too overwhelmed, for example, to make decisions about their baby in intensive care. I want you to pause for a second and think about that. Who is supposed to make decisions? Who is in a better position to make decisions than the parents who, who love their baby and worry about their baby? Parents may have these moments where they are shocked and frozen. They can move out of that state into a more present and oriented state where they can access their ability to think and, and be active in the team again. Parents make decisions as part of the healthcare team. They don't have all the information. They need the information that the doctor provides, that the nurse provides. So what happened with, with my daughter that day was not thankfully a medical massive crisis, maybe could have become one, did not become one. But I didn't have all the information. I didn't think I knew everything. I just needed them to look and pay attention and gather the information in a way that they knew how to gather it and how to interpret it. So I could raise the alarm that in that moment was my job and then they needed to do the rest of their job. That's the philosophy of care, okay? So if we can see families as whole, they benefit from that and they can bring more of themselves, their whole selves, and not be so scared by their own emotion. Because you know, people do get scared of their emotions. They get scared of what's going on inside them. And if, if we as the nurses and the, and the physicians and the, and the therapists and everybody can just say to them, you know, what you're experiencing is understandable for these reasons. It does not mean that you are no longer you. You, you still have these capacities. And, and can help them to find those capacities, especially if there's been a lot going on, a lot that's overwhelming, okay? They need to know we're gonna stick with them, that we're not gonna be scared of them. You know, the doctor who ran away was doing his best. I think he did not know what to do with, with a crying mother. 
Um, unfortunately, in, in, in that, my girl was born in 1996, it was one day I was sitting by the isolate and I was crying, I wasn't sobbing, I wasn't loud. And the unit social worker came up to me and said, maybe you want to step out. And even then I had the presence of mind to think, why? Why are, are you telling me that my emotion's gonna hurt my baby? Am I hurting somebody here? It was, it was disorienting. And it's hard for parents to say, you know, no, actually I'd like to stay. You need to stay. So we, we provide this developmental support for this journey that's different than the journey that they expected. We support parental vigilance. We, we support parents learning about their baby, doing what's important to them and helping them figure out how to do it in a way that is gonna support their baby and is, is safe for their baby. We need to know, they, we need to know as parents, parents need to know that we have confidence in their development. We have confidence that even though they may feel stuck in some ways, they may feel frozen and disoriented, because that's also temporary. And you know, in, in the age of COVID where many units are letting only one family member in at a time, for example, um, your role on the unit, if you work on a unit or if you're seeing a family member outside, is really important because you're gonna also help them bridge when they don't have their partner with them because there can only be one person on the unit at a time. You can also echo and reflect um, for them what it's like to feel this uncertainty. Um, and if you have somebody on the unit or somebody you're seeing who not only has a baby in intensive care or who has been in intensive care, but also has sick family members from COVID, you know, drawing those parallels can be really powerful and recognizing uh, what, what families have learned. You know, at the beginning of this pandemic, I, I, I found myself saying, I, I feel like, I, I feel, like, I feel a, a blog post coming. And I wrote, I wrote a blog post and then there, oh, there's another one coming, but it was not a blog post because it was writing itself in second person voice. That is not a blog post. That is, that is more literary. And what was coming up for me was, man, this feels like bed rest. Wow, does this feel like, like the NICU and the ICU? I've had ICU experience with, with one of my parents. This feels really familiar. I know what this is. When you talk about ventilators, when you talk about breathing problems, when you talk about needing to stay far away as a protective measure, to stay still, don't move, shelter in place, we know what that feels like. Now, for some people that can bring up the old trauma that's unprocessed and it feels like a tidal wave, but for people who've worked on that stuff, it still resonates. It felt to me like there was all of this old information that rushed to the front, sort of like, you called? I am here, I am ready to provide you with all of the contextual cues that you need to feel this again. You, yep, gotcha. Uh, it, was, it was all right there, all of that feeling all of that, uh, all those associative links were there to speak to this. Um, and so there's, there's a, uh, I did come out, the, the piece that I was writing, I wrote and needed some visual uh, accompaniment apparently, because it kept coming. And so uh, all of that is, uh, is actually up on my website, if anybody is interested in seeing what that can look like when something when, when this NICU experience and old experiences are evoked in the current climate for people, it, it brings up so much for people. So it's an opportunity as well, as well as its own, its own integration. Because you see, we, our work is both to hold on and to let go. I would not wanna forget the NICU experience. I identify far more with that experience than my daughters, who are now 24, by the way, um, identify. When they were writing their college essays, I, I was like, well, you were preemies and you were, and then they were like, huh? I don't talk about that. I don't know. Not, not relevant. They were much more interested in talking about being identical twins uh, or all kinds of other things. But I identify with so much of that experience. I hold on to that. I would give anything for them not to have had to experience what they experienced, to not have been, been born 10 weeks early with prenatal steroid exposure, with NICU steroid exposure, 
with all of the, the things that that uh, being born with unmyelinated neurons and immature brain nervous system brings, I would give anything for them not to have experienced that, but I wouldn't for a minute trade the development that I've had over the years and all of the things that I've learned, all of the relationships that I've formed, all of the stuff that I've gotten to experience and do because of, of that day, starting with that day. I'm gonna send you up to labor and delivery and put you on a monitor. And should I expect to be here all day? For the rest of your life, in one way or another. And that's okay. I really wouldn't trade it because it isn't the same day as it was then. It's a day that has evolved. It's an experience and sense of self and sense of connection and understanding that has evolved over those years. I can let go of the things that are ready to let go of. And so can the parents that you work with that are not important anymore. They weave in or they drop away and you move on. But when you step back and you look back, you see this has been integrated. There is healing here. And it changes and transforms us because it's supposed to. It's supposed to transform us. Parenthood always transforms us. And NICU parenthood transforms us in additional ways. Don't, don't try to get rid of that. It's powerful stuff. So now we have some time for questions. Great. Comments. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Stein. Speaking of powerful, that presentation was just that really powerful oh, thank stuff. You. Thank you so much. Um, so um, our, our first question was, was whether or not um, this presentation will be available later. And in case you didn't see that in the, in the chat, everybody, or in the, the Q&A, we definitely are recording it right now. And we will make that link available along with the, the evaluation excuse me, along with the evaluation um, this week. So, um, but so um, there's a question here about communication. Yeah. So your story about, why don't you, you know, your story about the, the doc or, or, or nurse who said, um, okay, you need to go and be monitored. And you said, mm -hmm. well, how long will I be here? Um, will this take all day? And right. it, Sounded, it sounds like you didn't really get a, a good answer to that question and um, or didn't get a complete answer. And so I expect that that was jarring to you once you realized how long you might actually be there. And I'm thinking about how could that exchange have gone differently or better, yeah. you know, for you as the patient, what would you mm -hmm. have preferred and what do you think you know, would you have preferred that yeah. they were just brutally honest in that moment? And, and this kind of relates to just sort of advice for caregivers when you have to deliver that heavy mm -hmm. information that they are not expecting. Yeah. Um, and you know, you have to be that person to change their life. <laughs> yeah. um, how, so how, it, what's the advice yeah, there? Good, yeah. Okay. So, so step back and think about the principles here, mm -hmm. our tasks and principles. Relationship-based care means that everything that happens, happens in the context of some kind of relationship. So the doctor that I saw that day was not my primary OB, but it was somebody who I'd seen before. So when you're giving news or you're making a recommendation that's about gathering more information, you may not know the answer to that question. You may not know what's coming next, but what you can say is, Think about continuity. Think about connection. So, for example, the doctor might have said to me, I'm going to send you up to labor and delivery. I, I'm off. I have a break or I can come see you and check in at such and such a time to see what's going on. There, here's, what, here's what to expect. Like, you're, they're going to put you on a monitor, put you in a bed and triage, put you on a monitor. They're probably like going to put you on future. an IV. Here, a saline yeah. IV. Mm -hmm. Here's what's going to happen next. 
and they're going to evaluate whether you're having some early contractions because you're dehydrated, maybe your contractions will slow down. There's a lot we don't know yet. So we're going to take this a bite at a time, a step at a time, but you're not alone. You're not right. alone here. You're being held here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So something like that in context mm -hmm. of, I'm not sending you off into the wilderness and we'll forget you. <laughs> you, mm -hmm. right. we, we're here, we're here and we're going to keep you can in uh, it, knowing what's happening every step of the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. No, that's great. Um, so again, from the healthcare provider perspective here, um, this question is, so it, when you're working in the NICU or a high stress environment, um, sometimes uh, a lot of healthcare providers talk about um, compartmentalizing in order to cope themselves so that they yes. can go to work every day mm -hmm. without falling apart, right? So, yeah, right. or being worn out or burning out. Um, and so what, it, I mean, I know your a lot of your presentation was was speaking to a lot of this, but but how do you um, how as a healthcare provider do you kind of keep yourself you know together and able to make those logical decisions in in, in which yeah. you often have to keep the emotion out of it, um, yeah, but still acknowledge the emotion that's going on. Um, that can be difficult um, for for absolutely absolutely no yeah. absolutely um, and. Both are so important. And mm -hmm. I mean, there is nothing like a NICU nurse <laughs> for, you know, my, my just deepest appreciation. Anytime I, I'm out in the, in the world in the days when we could all be in the same room together, when, when NICU nurses come to introduce themselves afterwards, I, I can't help but I just want to embrace you. Mm -hmm. You do so, so, so much that is so irreplaceable here. Think about those moments when there isn't an emergency happening with the baby you're taking care of, and hopefully you're not completely understaffed and you actually can take a breath. I know that's not always possible. If you think about the parent as a part of the team who actually ultimately can be helpful in the overall care of the baby, anything that you do to form that relationship with the parent to get what's happening with the parent ultimately is going to help you in your work because they're going to be able to be helpful in the care of the baby, not the technical care, not the you know, critical med medical care, but they're going to notice stuff. They're going to be there in a different kind of way than if they're scared and disconnected and distant. Mm -hmm. so, so it's important as, as a, a care provider in, in any ICU setting to be doing practices regularly that help you to keep your nervous system from being constantly on fire. Meditative practices, yoga, exercise, good relationships, good nourishment, sleep, anything that you can do to just take care of your body, take care of your nervous system and yourself and, and have these good relationships with people who matter to you. But think also about what, how your work matters to you beyond the technical. You have to be highly technical and highly skilled to be a NICU nurse. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, make, think about how you make meaning of what you do, what it means to you to be taking care of these fragile babies and their families. What is most satisfying to you in your work? There probably are some medical technical things that are really satisfying that you like to do. And consider, are there also some interpersonal things that are satisfying? And so from the context of those interpersonal things, remember, those count because they also ripple out to support the medical as well, whether it's via the parent or via the baby. So if you can facilitate kangaroo care, for example, even if the baby's still on a vent, that baby is going to be more stable. And so is the parent. Mm -hmm. So the investment of time and energy to do that and getting into a routine around that is actually going to give you less work on the back end later, most likely. Plus, it's really meaningful and it's really satisfying. So, so managing that, the more meaningful your work is, the less likely you're going to be to burn out. Sure. 
So sure. those are some places to look. No, that's great. Great advice. Um, we've got two more questions. I know we're right up, we're at one o'clock here. Um, so, uh, you know, the recording will be available if you mm -hmm. have to run everybody, mm -hmm. but and I'm, um, I can we've got a couple a questions bit. if you're okay with that, Dr. Stein. Um, uh, yes, yes. Okay. Um, do you have any advice for care coordinators who meet families in their home uh, mm -hmm. to be helpful to NICU families? So um, in their home while the baby's still in the hospital, while once the baby is home? You know, I don't know about maybe both. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, if you, uh, I'm not, if you so, want to so follow either up. Either way, I mean, I would say no matter what, the, so this is, this is something, uh, a concept that can be very helpful both in the NICU and outside the NICU. Remember, whenever you're interfacing with a family, you're both a host and a guest. So when you're at the bedside, you are, you are the host because you're in the NICU, you're the NICU staff, but you're also a guest in the family. When you're, when you're at a family's home, when you're visiting a family, you are really a guest in the family and they are welcoming you into their home. So again, this idea that families have a lot that they're bringing to the table here. And so when you can approach them with, with openness and curiosity and respect to say, tell me about you guys, what matters to you? What do you need? Not just pragmatic stuff, but what would help, like if you're doing discharge planning. When, when, when we came home from the hospital with two giant green oxygen tanks um, and like two little tiny portable tanks, um, and after about a week of that, I, I mean, care coordination was not great. And I'm sitting on the phone with the insurance company trying to explain to them why getting another oxygen tank or two for the main floor would really help with these two babies on oxygen and apnea monitors. And I'm saying, well, no, that's, that's just convenience. It's sort of like, you know, cosmetic surgery. It's not necessary surgery. It's, it's, yeah, that would just make life easier for you. I'm like, oh, yeah. yeah. Can we do that maybe <laughs> so that I can have some more mobility here with these babies mm -hmm. and not be trapped in a bedroom? Mm -hmm. um, things like that. Like what matters to you? Well, what matters is that I can around. What matters is maybe I want to do, I want to have a baby in a sling. Well, I can have a baby in a sling and walk around if ask people what matters to them. Right. You won't know unless you yeah. ask, right? You don't know if you ask, right? And some things are possible, some things are not, but you can right. ask what details you might not be thinking of that could make a big difference. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, okay. I think this is the last, well, this is the last question we have. Um, thank you for this powerfully moving presentation. How can early intervention therapists best support parents best. following the transition from NICU mm -hmm. to home? And in parens, she says, relationship-based parental identity. You betcha. Oh boy. Also some of my favorite people. Um, the, the EI. Um, help parents to navigate the balance between their parental job and taking on the role of PT, OT, speech, all of these, all the therapies. Um, because parents want to do everything they can to help their baby's development and very often end up being the feeding therapist, being the, you know, doing PT exercises and OT exercises, and they get all worked up about that kind of stuff. Now, there is a balance here where incorporating some of those exercises or play or whatever needs to be done is necessary and helpful, but help parents to see how what they might do naturally as parents may, may need to be modified or accommodated for, for their baby but that that's developmentally supportive for their baby. Help them to see how important what they do, what their natural nurturing instincts are, how powerful and effective those are, that they can be them. They need, their baby needs them. So what happens sometimes is, you know, you may hear that and, and, and then, so then a parent says to me, yeah, I was told, just be the mom. Yes, but what does that mean? Just be the mom means I'm vigilant. So now I'm, know what to do with right. that what that means is do you want to go to the park do you want to take a walk do you want to sit with the baby and and hand him or her a leaf 
you know, to, to touch, to what would you do if you didn't have early intervention in your house? What are things you'd like to do? What are things that you're not sure it's okay to do? Maybe it is. Help them see how, well, you know, here's what that's doing for your baby. Do it for that reason, but you know what? Do it because it's fun. Do it because what your baby needs and what you need is connection. What your baby needs is that you are comfortable dancing in the relationship back and forth with him or her so that there's that bond, there's that communication and, and attunement to your, to your newborn, to your baby, to your growing toddler. That actually forms the bedrock and the foundation for all development. That relationship is critically important. Parents often don't realize how powerful and important things that, that they would want to do and naturally do, how powerful that is. It comes out of how much we do in the NICU, how much we see being done in the NICU and in, in follow-up care. So the, the feeling or the belief, even if it's not articulated, is if I'm not doing something, I'm not doing enough. So recognizing that the soft stuff is really powerful is important. And so make sure you know that. Make sure you really get that so that you can pass it over in ways that are, are really gonna be authentic and you know, uh, believable. <laughs> but you really believe it because you really see it. Right, right. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Stein. I think that we've, we've answered all the questions and you know, we're a little over time. So thanks to those of you who are able to st stay with us. Um, if you have any other questions that you, yeah, if you have any other questions, please email uh, WAPC at perinatalweb.org and we'll make sure to connect you. Um, so could we go to, let's uh, maybe advance. Do you have that last slide? I do. Yeah. Oh, here's, oh. here's books and resources, but oh, you'll nice. have that if you like. Nice. Fantastic. We, well, I'll, we'll make sure, we should put some of that in the media I'll give you list. yeah I'll give you links yes yes that would be great okay I just wanted to make sure um, that everybody's aware of the next webinars we've got coming up in the series um, we have had a, a postponement our next webinar which was originally scheduled for July 14th has been postponed making our care for children and their parents trauma-informed during COVID-19 so stay tuned for more news on that um, but please make sure to um, if you haven't already marked your calendars for July 21st when we will be discussing perinatal mental health services for fathers uh, helping men become health partners and parents amidst COVID-19 with Dr. Paul Florsheim who is an expert in this in this field and so we're really excited to have him join us as well but uh, thank you again um, Mara Tesler sign we are so grateful that you shared this powerful presentation with us um, this great information great advice um, I can't say enough uh, how, how grateful we are that you joined us today. So thank you all. It's and can't, a pleasure. Yeah, ours as well. And uh, to all of the, everybody out there, thank you for the great questions you submitted. Thank you for participating in this. Of course, we couldn't do this without all of you participating. Um, and so please, we want to make sure that um, you stay with us and join us next time as well in this series. So thanks again, everyone. Um, and have a great rest of your afternoon. Bye-bye.